morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar. We are going to get started here in just a minute or so. And I see that we have people joining the, the program. So we'll let everyone get settled and we'll go ahead and get started in just a minute here. And again, welcome, and we're glad you're here. And for any of you who just joined, we will get started in uh, just a moment here. We're gonna make sure that everyone who registered is uh, able to join, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Alrighty, well, by my watch, it is 10 o'clock and we're gonna go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Darling and I am the Manager of Membership and Annual Giving here at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture. And welcome to this latest edition of our member-only virtual program, Curator Conversations. Uh, you may have seen or heard that we have uh, just a small exhibition coming to us next month that is all about space. Um, and of course, that's uh, a joke about it being small. It's actually very large and it's going to take uh, take us through all sorts of parts of our race to the moon, uh, Virginia's connection to our national space program, NASA. And we're really excited about it. And this is sort of our, our sneak peek for our members before we have the exhibition come to us next month. So before I hand it over to Andy Takoff, who's our Senior Director for Curatorial Affairs, just a few bits of housekeeping. Uh, if you have any technical difficulties during the program, please let myself know in the chat. Um, we have our technical guru, Haley Fenner, who's on the call, who will be able to assist as well. We will also have the live transcript, so the, the closed captioning at the bottom of the screen. If you would like that to be turned on or off, you can go to the bottom of your Zoom screen where you have the options to show captions or turn captions off. And if you have any questions related to that, again, put that in the chat and we'll do our best to assist you. And we will have time for questions at the end of the program. If you think of any throughout the program, please add those to the Q&A or to the chat. And I believe that that is everything. So I will go ahead and turn it over to Andy Talkoff, um, who's going to take us on a, a journey uh, that's out of this world. <laughs> Thanks, Elizabeth. I'm going to have to start working on my um, space puns as I go through this. Uh, well, good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to our February Curator Conversation. Um, as Elizabeth said, um, we'll be opening um, a major uh, exhibition, one of the whoop, one of the largest that we've uh, really ever mounted, called Apollo um, When We Went to the Moon, and um, we'll talk about the exhibit uh, in a second. Um, but before we do, um, some of you may actually have, um, have memories of when uh, Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon. Um, and I have been very, uh, very interested in, as we get ready to open the exhibit, in talking to people about what their experiences were so if you were one of the 53 million people worldwide that was actually watching as Neil Armstrong stepped foot on the moon, um, we'd love to hear what your recollections are. So as the program goes on and as you have time, if you want to leave a brief message or, or longer in the chat, um, that, would be, that would be great. And we can talk about those or share some of those at the, at the end. Um, so... The uh, Apollo When We Went to the Moon is a traveling exhibit. It's been traveling since uh, 2020, and it's organized by an exhibition company called Flying Fish, uh, who partnered with the U.S. Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, uh, Alabama, to put together a show that um, the primary story covers from the beginning of the space race uh, and the launch of Sputnik uh, 
In fact, there's a full scale model of Sputnik in, uh, hanging from the gallery ceiling right now. Um, through a really modern day um, with international cooperation that occurred after the Cold War and even during the latter part of the Cold War. So it's a pretty expansive story about the 400,000 people that made uh, that made our landing on the moon possible, um, at least the U.S.'s landing on the moon possible, um, and about uh, the impact that that had, you know, on on the nation and on the world. Um, as we tend to do, um, we wanted to talk also about what Virginia's role in the space program is. And I have to admit that I was talking to someone the other day, and I told them what I was working on. And they said Virginia had a role in the space program. And so I got to launch into um, very much the conversation you're going to hear today. Um, but Virginia did, in fact, have a significant impact uh, on our human space program. And so uh, in our uh, Good uh, Gallery, the Susan and David Good Gallery, we have uh, a piece of the exhibition that we organized called From Virginia to the Moon. And I have to say that um, we really owe a great debt of thanks to the team at uh, NASA Langley Research Center, who not only helped us get um, up to speed on the space program and their role in the space program, um, but also was able to loan some artifacts for you to see during the exhibition. So what I thought we would do today, um, because I was relatively new to this subject as well, um, and what I thought would be fun would be to talk about some of the things that, um, as a primer for your visit to come to the exhibition, whether it's to our member opening event uh, on the 15th of March, um, or, you know, with your friends and family later on. Um, so to start, um, and very much where the Apollo ex exhibition begins is about the John F. Kennedy Initiative, or maybe I should have said John F. Kennedy Challenge. So um, some of you probably know that, um, you know, after Sputnik, uh, and the Russians beating us uh, to have the first artificial uh, moon uh, in orbit, um, there was a great deal of consternation in the United States because not only was um, was ev you know every ninety six minutes the Russian satellite passed over the United States, which was horrifying in some ways to people because if they could do that every 96 minutes, they could weaponize space, uh, they could spy uh, on the United States. Um, so it had a lot of um, security implications, um, but also it was embarrassing because the United States um, was uh, trying to prove to the world that a democratic capitalist form of government was the, um, was the, the best form of government and economy. And this is how trying to influence the nation, we entered a Cold War with the Soviet Union. I have to say that I was interested to learn that the Soviets were pretty much ahead of us through very much of this period. Um, they were the first to put a satellite into orbit. Um, they were the first to put a human in space. Um, they were the first to orbit the Earth. They uh, launched the first woman into space. One of their probes was the first to reach the moon. They did the first spacewalk. Um, and it really wasn't until about 1967 that in their efforts to try to beat us to the moon, um, their technology failed them. And so uh, they redirected. So uh, in 1962, uh, President Kennedy uh, issues his challenge to the nation during an address at Rice University uh, in Texas. 
and many of you probably and the name of this program is is uh, based on this. Um, you probably may remember the footage so uh, and the the um, words that he used. So this is an image actually of the reading version of his address at Rice University with his notes in it. And so the meaningful paragraph here is where he says, but why some say the moon? Why choose this as a goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? And then he inserted a joke about Rice University uh, uh, you know, playing their rival football team. Um, and he says, we choose to go to the moon in this decade, not because that will be easy, but because it will be hard, because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. So, um, after a speech like that, you would assume that Kennedy was all, uh, all aboard uh, on our space program. And this was a major uh, issue for him, not because he was particularly interested in learning about space, but he was desperate to beat the Russians in the space race. So one question that... Uh, you have to, we have to ask is, if President Kennedy had not been assassinated, would Neil Armstrong have stepped foot on the moon in 1969? And the answer is not likely. Uh, given the, um, given a, a, a number of sources, including tapes from his conversations at the White House, um, it was very clear, as I said, that Kennedy was interested in beating the Russians in space. Um, but was not particularly interested in space. And he became even less interested in pursuing a moon landing um, when he realized when NASA officials were telling him that the landing would probably not happen until very much the end of the decade, like 1969. Um, and so the, you know, the United States was spending incredible amounts of money uh, Kennedy was spending incredible amounts of his political capital to fund the space program. And he started to question if he's not going to be president when, uh, when this achievement is made, because they had earlier talked about it coming earlier in the decade. Um, did he really want to spend that kind of political capital on this? And so... Um, in uh, White, White House meetings, um, he told NASA Administrator James Webb that um, he wasn't that interested in space um, and began to actually think about, um, you know, pulling back on the space program. So we may not have made it in 1969, except for the fact that Kennedy was assassinated in 1963. And because one of Kennedy's legacies was this challenge to get to the moon, it was the Johnson administration that doubled down on getting us to the moon. And so um, funding for NASA increased, staffing for NASA increased, and, um, and the effort, the challenge was made to get there by the end of the decade. So who knows what would have happened had Kennedy remained president for the rest of his term or maybe a second term. But it's one of the interesting things about um, this time period that um, suggests that the uncertainties of history uh, or of events have a very a significant influence on history in ways that we may not think about. So, um, Back to the question, did Virginia have a space program um, I can, or was part of the space program? I can assure you that we were. And in fact, there's a very strong argument to be made that our human space program was actually born in Virginia. Uh, we always associate especially uh, the space program with Florida and with Texas. Um, but 
we have a claim to being the birthplace of the space program. So in order to sort of dig into this a little bit, I think, uh, and a place where our one of our pieces of the exhibition starts is with the formation of an organization called the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, which was started in 1915. This was the first federal effort to try to answer the questions about flight. Um, and over the uh, 40 uh, some years of its existence, uh, NACA was uh, doing testing at one of their, they had a number of facilities, but their first facility was here in Hampton, Virginia at Lang, at what would become the Langley Memorial Research uh, Center. And so NACA spent uh, the first almost half of the century um, trying to improve flight to the point where um, we came to, to see the edge of space, flying higher, flying faster. Um, uh, NACA was incredibly influential. But in 1957, the Soviets launched Sputnik and we enter the space race and that's when NASA is formed in 1958 and NASA absorbs all of the NACA research centers. And so when we started, when the government started thinking about the first human in space program, they set up an organization called the Space Task Group uh, formed in 1958, right here in Hampton, Virginia. Um, they managed what we'll talk about, uh, the first human in space program, Project Mercury. Um, but after Kennedy's challenge to get to the moon by the end of the 1960s, it was very clear to NASA leadership that they needed a bigger facility. Um, and so in 1961, they moved to Houston, Texas. Um, but the, and the, they renamed the organization the Manned Spacecraft Center. But we can say one of the most important things that happened at NASA Langley um, was that how we were going to get to the moon was decided uh, by the efforts of one of the engineers uh, at, at Langley. So in the 19, early 1960s, there were essentially three different ways that we thought we could get to the moon. The direct approach, which is at the far left of your screen, um, is essentially the Buck Rogers version of getting to the moon. One spacecraft launches from the Earth, goes all the way to the moon, lands on the moon, and then takes off from the moon and returns back to Earth. Um, by many accounts, this was not incredibly practical, especially given the time frame that they had because of the size of the vehicle that would be necessary in order to do both of those things. Um, the generally accepted version around NASA was a process called Earth Orbit Rendezvous, where essentially, two spacecraft would launch into Earth's orbit. One would largely contain fuel for the trip to the moon, and the other would contain the astronauts and a number of other pieces of the spacecraft. And so in Earth's orbit, the astronauts would assemble this spacecraft and then launch from Earth's orbit to the moon. Um, and again, this was in many ways uh, the favorite option for NASA. But there was another way, which was called lunar, lunar orbit rendezvous, which, which required a, uh, a, a single rocket uh, in multiple stages to uh, uh, get to moon and the moon and orbit the moon. And then a smaller vehicle and lighter vehicle would go from that vehicle to the moon surface return to that vehicle, and then they would return to Earth. So these are the three options. And it's really because of this fellow. His name is uh, Dr. John uh, Hubolt. Uh, 
Um, here you can see him describing the lunar orbit rendezvous concept in 1962. Um, it was through his efforts um, and his dedication to this idea, saying to the people at NASA that this wasn't only the best way to get there, but it was the only way in the time frame that we had to get from the Earth to the moon. And so any of you familiar with the Apollo project uh, know that uh, this, is, this is the way that this was done. The concept wasn't originated in Langley, but it was Hubalt's efforts to convince everyone that this was the best way to go that actually directed all of the engineering that was gonna happen and all of the projects that would get us to the moon from that point on. There was something else though in deciding how we were gonna to get to the moon that also came from Langley that's much less known. And that's called the Lunar Orbiter Project. So a lot of you are probably familiar with this image, which is called Earthrise. Um, it was the first image taken by a person, uh, astronaut William Anders, um, of the Earth from uh, lunar orbit. Uh, it was taken in 1968 as part of the Apollo 8 mission. Um, and of course, this was uh, is one of the most famous photographs uh, ever taken. Um, and in fact, this image and images like it um, would help spur um, the environmental movement uh, in the late 1960s. But fewer people are familiar with this image that was taken by Lunar Orbiter 1 in 1966. And this is the first image of the Earth uh, taken from the moon by a spacecraft. So the Lunar Orbiter Project was five um, orbiters that, whose purpose was to take images of the lunar surface. And this fellow in the corner, Norman Craybill, um, was, uh, uh, worked at Langley and organized this project. Um, Dr. Craybill is still alive. And in discussions about his role in, in directing this project, um, he actually tells a very interesting story about how this photograph may not have actually uh, been taken because the contractors that were working with NASA to organize the photography, uh, when they saw this, when Crabill saw this image come up on the screen, or at least the possibility of taking this image, um, they, the the contractor said that they weren't allowed to take the image because it wasn't part of the contract. And so there was a discussion uh, uh, in the facility and ultimately they decided to snap the shot. So it's a very interesting story of a photograph that may never have been. The more important photographs are photographs like these, which actually mapped the surface of the moon. Um, so put together, all of these images gave uh, the folks at NASA, a very good sense of where possible landing sites would be. Um, the arrow here shows the Apollo 11. That's our first lunar landing, the Apollo 11 landing site, um, photographed by Lunar Orbiter 5 in 1967. Um, so this is another contribution. In addition to training astronauts uh, through a number of simulators, um, this was another major contribution to the U.S. space program um, that came right, right out of Virginia. Um, and you'll learn many other ways that Virginia participated uh, in getting us to the moon. But as far as how we were going to get there and where we would go when we got there, um, Virginia is the birthplace of, of these ideas. Um, so in talking about uh, NACA, Langley and NASA Langley, one of the things that they are best known for are their wind tunnels. Um, the, uh, the first sig really significant wind tunnel um, at uh, Langley was built in 1922. It was called the uh, Variable Density Wind Tunnel. Um, and it really revolutionized the study of how aircraft would 
uh, be affected by uh, the force of the force of air. Um, and Langley is very well known for having um, having wind tunnels. At one point, they had as many as twenty three. Um, but in the post Cold War years, there was a reduction of wind tunnels, and um, so now there are about eleven wind tunnels at Langley. Um, some of the wind tunnels I list here still exist and some don't. Um, the full scale tunnel, which you can see in the top left corner of your screen, where they're testing a full scale uh, mercury capsule, um, was the only one of its kind in the world when it was built in, um, in the uh, 1930s, 1931. Um, it was the building was demolished in 2011, but it operated till 2009. They could test full scale aircraft there. Um, but the wind tunnels went uh, to much smaller scales. So in the lower right, there's a model of the Gemini capsule being tested in the Langley's 11 inch hypersonic tunnel in 1962. And in fact, this model that's in this photograph is in the exhibit that we have here. So really great uh, to be able to match an object with this image. Um, so really big models and really small models all helped to develop better flight uh, and, uh, and test our space vehicles. But the things that I want you to notice here are some things that um, were new to me in my vocabulary. Um, you can see that there is a supersonic pressure tunnel. There's a subsonic tunnel. There's a supersonic wind tunnel. There's transonic dynamics tunnels. Um, so what I thought would be fun for a minute uh, would be to talk a little bit about um, wind tunnel speed and a term that you'll see a fair amount in the exhibition is the term Mach, which is essentially the speed of an object divided by the speed of sound. Um, so Mach 1 is, um, is, at the, is just at the speed of sound, and it's about 767 miles per hour or 1,125 feet per second. Um, of course, um, the speed of sound is going to vary based on the environment, particularly temperature uh, of the air. But this is basically, this is as much math, by the way, as, as you'll need to know for this. Um, but this is term Mach that comes up fairly frequently. So in talking about subsonic, right, anything that is subsonic is underneath sonic uh, speeds below Mach 1. So as an example, um, the fastest commercial jet that you can travel in today travels at about 680 miles an hour. Um, at Langley, they can test transonic speeds, which is at around Mach 1. So some of you may be familiar with Chuck Yeager. He, in 1947, is the first pilot to break the sound barrier, which is a speed that, um, you know, that uh, contributes to our ability to build space vehicles and improve vehicle speeds. So he was traveling at about 700 miles an hour at Mach 1.03. This is back in 1947. And the image here is the Bell X-1 which was an experimental aircraft um, that was used at that time. So then we talk about supersonic speed, which is above Mach 1. So uh, if you've ever been to the uh, Science Museum of Virginia, you've seen the SR-71 that they have hanging from their ceiling. Um, that craft could travel at 2,200 miles an hour, which is about Mach 3. So supersonic is over Mach 1, and then hypersonic is anything over Mach 5. So this kind of blew my mind. As the Apollo astronauts are re-entering the Earth's atmosphere, 
they're free falling at about 20,000 miles an hour, which is Mach 26. So the Langley wind tunnels are able to test these high speeds um, and test things that are exactly like the heat shield that would be used to protect astronauts uh, as they re-enter re -enter the environment. So I started this whole discussion about, you know, with faster than a speeding bullet. So how fast is a speeding bullet? So the fastest bullet travels at about 1,772 miles an hour, which is about Mach 2.3. So all fun facts that you can help your friends and relatives understand as you work your way through these, through these exhibitions. Um, the other thing that I thought would be helpful is uh, to talk about the three general phases of our human space program that led to the moon landing. Uh, and I say named for the gods because each one of those projects was named for, uh, for a god. So Project Mercury is our first human in space program. It ran from about 1958 to 1963. There were six piloted flights. And the objective of the Mercury project was essentially to, uh, to get the first uh, American in space, uh, to orbit a crewed spacecraft around the Earth, um, to see how people would function in space, and of course, to recover both the astronaut and spacecraft safely. I will say that uh, when Yuri Gagarin uh, beats the United States in 1961, April 12th, 1961, uh, into space, um, they weren't actually able to fulfill the second half of that last objective. Um, so Yuri Gagarin actually had to abandon his spacecraft uh, hundreds of miles in the air um, and parachute down. And so the spacecraft, you know, is no longer in existence. Um, I can't imagine what that experience would have been like, but I think being able to come down in your spacecraft um, would have been, uh, uh, was certainly um, uh, in, appreciated by our Mercury astronauts. So these are the first seven astronauts at left of our uh, space pro uh, human and space program. Um, they're generally known as the Mercury 7, and they were selected in 1959, um, 1960. Uh, among this group is Alan Shepard, who was the first uh, uh, human uh, in, in space, um, as well as John Glenn, um, who would be the first uh, American to orbit, uh, orbit, orbit the Earth. Um, in his capsule Friendship 7. Uh, he did that in 1962. Um, among the other stories that are associated with our Mercury program um, is, again, returning astronauts safely to Earth. And um, one of the best known people uh, who has become best known for this is Katherine Johnson. Um, so Katherine Johnson joined Langley's segregated West Area computers. And when I say computers, these are human computers, not electronic computers, um, in 1953. And she was uh, tasked to the space task group when uh, NACA turned into NASA and started helping them prepare for Project Mercury. And by 1960, she developed the critical equations, some of which you can see at right, um, that would calculate the trajectory of an orbital object so that they could pinpoint where it would land on Earth. This is particularly important for astronauts who, um, in this period, are going to land you know, in the ocean. And so they need to be recovered by the Navy um, and the naval ships need to be near them in order to recover them you know, quickly and safely. And so 
Katherine Johnson becomes an expert on these, on calculating these types of trajectories. And of course, if you've seen the film Hidden Figures, um, even though it's a little bit more highly dramatized, you know that in the days leading up to John Glenn's orbital flight, um, they were giving him trajectory figures that were produced by an IBM computer, but he knew of Katherine Johnson and wanted her to check the numbers that the computer had produced uh, before he would fly. Um, in the movie, this seems to happen moments before he is going to take off. It happened, in fact, days earlier. And if you're interested in learning more about Katherine Johnson, um, many of the other um, uh, Black women who were human computers, um, uh, you know, the movie Hidden Figures uh, tells that story. And we'll actually be doing one of our uh, very popular movie myth busting programs on hidden figures on March on May 9th. So you'll want to keep your eyes out for that um, so that you can participate in that program. Um, I'll also say that uh, as uh, because Katherine Johnson became uh, better known because of the film Hidden Figures. Um, she came to be honored later in her life in many ways, including being awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2015 by President Barack Obama. And in 2018, Langley's new computational research facility was named in her, her honor. Um, I should say that Mercury, it's named Project Mercury because uh, Mercury was a god with great speed. Um, so that's why NASA named that project Mercury. So the next move after that was uh, into Project Gemini or Gemini, sorry. I've always pronounced it Gemini through my whole life, but even in archival footage of the way folks at NASA were pronouncing it, it's Gemini. So we'll say Project Gemini. And this went from 1962 to about 1966. Um, there were 10 crewed missions, and unlike the Mercury spacecraft, which had one astronaut, the Gemini uh, a spacecraft had two astronauts, which is why they called it Gemini, for the twins. Um, so there were 10 crewed missions, and essentially they wanted to subject astronauts to longer duration flights, develop methods, because remember, they had to rendezvous two spacecraft in the lunar orbit. They needed to practice and test ways of being able to rendezvous with two orbiting vehicles in the vastness of space and then actually dock them together. Um, they wanted to perfect the re-entry and landing of a spacecraft. Um, and they wanted to understand the effects of weightlessness on crew members for long duration flights. The longest duration flight in the Gemini project was eight days because it takes four days for astronauts to get from the Earth to the moon and four days for them to get back. So they wanted to test what the effects of that would be on astronauts. Um, some of the great accomplishments of Project Gemini on the, on the left is uh, you can see the very tip of the Gemini 8 capsule. Um, approaching the um, test vehicle called the Agena, uh, which was in Earth's orbit the way that they were testing how to join two uh, vehicles together in space. Um, and then on the right um, is an image of astronaut Ed White as he floats outside Gemini uh, 4. So the first spacewalk made by an American occurred in 1965. Um, Ed White was out for 20 minutes or so, um, and uh, the folks at Mission Control were actually um, ordering him. He didn't want to go back in the ship, so they were ordering him back in, and you can hear audio of that, um, which you'll hear in the exhibition. Um, the thing I love about this photograph is that in the reflection of his helmet, you get a really good view of the Gemini capsule. And then, of course, there's Project Apollo, um, which was from 1963 to 1972. 
Um, there were six successful lunar landings. Um, and the, uh, uh, the objective here, whoops, I uh, repeated this, uh, some of the notes on this slide, but the objective here was to obviously put the first man uh, or human on, on the moon. Um, so on the left, you can see uh, the lunar module, which is the smaller craft from lunar orbit that will land on the moon. This is in two parts. This is the Apollo 16 lunar module uh, in 1972. Um, and when the astronauts would return, only the top half of this vehicle would return to the lunar orbit to reconnect with the command module uh, for their you know, start back to Earth. Um, so the bottom portion, this gold foiled uh, portion is still on the moon. Um, and new imaging uh, of the lunar surface uh, very clearly shows where all six of these lunar module platforms are still are still located. Um, another great achievement of the Apollo project was um, the development of a of a car for space. Um, the, the the lunar roving a vehicle was actually created, uh, uh, designed by General Motors and built by Boeing. Um, it extended the range of astronauts for experiment and exploration um, to an incredible degree. Um, and that vehicle had to fit inside a five foot tall by five foot deep by five foot wide at its base triangular space in this lunar module. So it basically folds up uh, into, that, into that shape. Um, so just by comparison, um, and there are quite a few models in this exhibition. Um, so at the far left, you can see the tallest is the Saturn V rocket that was part of the Apollo project. And that is about 363 feet tall. You can see by scale the rockets that, uh, which were essentially missiles that uh, existed in our arsenal, uh, were much smaller to get into Earth's, Earth's orbit. So the Gemini Titan II, which is the one in the middle, was about 109 feet tall, and the Mercury Redstone, um, which is at the far right of that of those drawings is about 83 feet tall. And then you get a sense here of what each one of those capsules looked like. The bottom one being the one astronaut Mercury uh, capsule, the Gemini capsule with two astronauts, and then there are three astronauts in the Apollo Saturn V uh, configuration. So as we start to wrap up, um, I think one of the interesting things that uh, the exhibit, uh, the exhibits touch on is that the space program did not happen in a vacuum. Um, in fact, the 1960s were one of the most turbulent decades in, in our nation's history. Um, there was uh, a resurgence in the civil rights movement. We were uh, growing in our engagement in uh, wars uh, of uh, influence against communists, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia and Vietnam. Um, there was uh, poverty and, uh, you know, poor schools and all the problems, many of the problems that, you know, still exist today. Um, but then there was this huge investment being made in getting to the moon. Um, and so there was opposition, you know, so it, it, in the aftermath of the moon landing, um, and in the years since, there's, there's a very romantic view of this project uh, and a lot of pride in that the United States have been the only uh, nation to land uh, astronauts on the moon. Um, it came at a great expense. Uh, it, it was 28, a $28 billion project over uh, 12 years. Um, and throughout the 1960s, it was 
uh, only marginally popular. About 45 to 60 percent of Americans actually didn't think at various times that it was worth the cost. There was an uptick, of course, when Neil Armstrong steps foot on the moon uh, for Apollo 11. But in general, you know, the majority of Americans were lukewarm to, uh, to the space program. Um, so, uh, you know, one uh, critic, uh, early critic was uh, Rachel Carson, the author of Silent Spring. She wrote in 1958 after Sputnik um, to, uh, to her friend, she said in this pre-Sputnik days, it was easy to dismiss uh, so much, meaning like, these visions of going to, um, to other planets or other bodies in space as science fiction. She says, now the most far-fetched schemes seem entirely possible at achievement, and man seems actually likely to take into his hands, ill-prepared as he is psychologically, many of the functions of God. Um, she would then publish Silent Spring, um, which awoke uh, the environmental movement, and as I said earlier, was interestingly enough, bolstered by these images that were coming back from space of, of the earth. Um, so um, that was Rachel Carson's view. Um, the uh, leaders of the civil rights movement were um, questioned the space project, space program too. This is an image of uh, the Reverend Ralph Abernathy and others uh, protesting uh, in Florida at the Apollo 11 moon launch site. Um, and so he said, on the eve of man's noblest venture, I am profoundly moved by the nation's achievements in space and the heroism of the three men embarking for the moon. But what we can do for space and exploration, we demand that we do for starving people. Um, so, you know, the, th this entire project although remarkable in so many ways, um, uh, was controversial, uh, even in, in its own day. And, and, you know, 50 years later, we may not remember that as well, but I'm, I'm pleased that this exhibition puts uh, the space program in the time that it existed, within the Cold War, within the struggle for Soviet versus U.S. influence um, around the world, uh, and in the context of a major and growing war in Southeast Asia and, and in the civil rights movement and with a, a significant peace movement, um, all of these things are swirling around as, you know, as Neil Armstrong steps foot on the moon. Um, but there are lots of arguments as to why the space program uh, was and continues to be uh, to be worth it. Um, there are a number of technological achievements that come out of the uh, Gemini, Mercury, Apollo project. Um, you know, some of these are uh, things that affect our everyday lives, like um, integrated circuits. Uh, uh, the Apollo project drove forward the development of integrated circuits that are used in a lot of technology today. Um, fireproof proof materials um, developed for astronauts are now being worn by firefighters. Um, and um, of course, freeze-dried foods uh, uh, become uh, weren't new to the space program, but were uh, expanded during the space program, except for astronaut ice cream, which does not make it onto uh, the space flights. Um, but I think that, you know, in addition, the knowledge, I mean, we're a curious people and able to want to understand the world that we live in and the universe that we live in. And so the space program has given us a greater understanding of, of that. Um, it's prepared us for the next leg of the journey as we enter into the Artemis generation. So last November, Artemis won. Uh, which is, is now the most powerful rocket that's ever been built, even though it was slightly shorter than the Saturn V rocket that um, took astronauts to the moon. Um, 
it's gone to the moon and beyond. Uh, right now with um, no pilots, uh, that mission went with two uh, test uh, figures and a Snoopy, uh, a Snoopy doll. Um, but, um, but we'll soon go to the moon and then from the moon to Mars and beyond as we continue to explore our universe. And, and the space program in the 1960s informed the space program that we're in now. Um, and then ultimately, I think that more philosophically, the extraordinary effort in the 1960s to do what, when Kennedy first offered this challenge to go to the moon in 1961 in front of Congress, the longest we had been in space was 15 minutes. And so by the end of the decade, we had landed a person on the moon. Um, and I think that the space program, uh, particularly the Apollo project, does affirm that with inspired leadership, appropriate resources, and clear purpose, that the hardest problems that we encounter here on Earth, in our communities, can certainly be solved. So with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Um, and uh, certainly, if anyone had memories of, of, uh, of where they were uh, in 1969, I'd be interested to hear those too. Thank you so much, Andy. Yeah, we, we got some great comments, uh, recollections of where they were when the moon landing happened. And then there were also some questions as well. So I'll uh, go through the comments of memories of where they were from um, Allison and John Williams, our wedding weekend. We actually took time to watch the fateful event, which made July 19, 1969, even more memorable. Hmm. Uh, and then from Lorna and Jeffrey Clark, I was astonished and awed. I was 23 and in graduate school in Cincinnati, Ohio. It was a very hot, humid night in July. My wife at the time and I watched breathlessly as the events of the evening unfolded. And then from Kathy Wright, I was 10 years old. As I remember, our pastor said the Sunday evening service would be abbreviated to make sure all were home to watch history being made. My family opted to skip church that night so this child would be well rested. My parents mm -hmm. even allowed us to eat in the den in front of the TV, another historical den at the time. <laughs> <laughs> we used the ski ball table to hold our food. And um, let's see. And then Marty and Michael uh, Lyko in 1969, my father took us to Florida and we saw the first moon launch. Oh, wow. wow. That's amazing. One of the one of the experiences in the exhibit is this sort of three sided theater with a, an incredible sound system that sort of puts you at the rocket uh, for the first launch of Apollo or Apollo 11. Um, and um, it's incredibly moving. I mean, I think um, I think it's hard not to be in awe, to, you know, to watch people take flight in in that way um, and escape you know, the bonds of, of Earth. Uh, it's just amazing. Well, thank you to those who put in your comments. Uh, Andy, I, I think you would be open if they think of memories later on. I think you would want them to send them to you via email. Is that correct? Oh, yeah, that would be great. I'd love yes. to, to hear how people are, uh, how people experience that. Um, so I don't know, I, I can give you my email address, I think, which is easiest. Yes. Uh, um, so I think Haley, Haley, if you can put that in the chat, just if anyone wants to jot that down. Great. Um, and then we did have some, some questions in the chat as well. Yay. So uh, we have the first question here is, why was it called Apollo? Ah, good question. Um, so uh, at NASA, uh, uh, there was an employee uh, at a fairly high level, who was inspired by the image of Apollo on his chariot uh, crossing across the sun. And so this um, led him to think that that would be a good idea for the project. And they, and they uh, uh, obviously adopted that. I should mention, which 
you know, I didn't know because I'm not really up on my um, my Greek and Roman gods as much. Um, but that the reason that Artemis uh, is called Artemis is because Artemis is Apollo's twin. Um, so it's the next phase, you know, of our of our efforts to get to the moon and beyond. It makes me wonder if we years in the future are we ever going to run out of gods for yeah, a problem for future generations of NASA employees. They, what are they we may go. Do? They may go in a other space project or named lots of yeah. other things. So. Um, all right, and then we have another question here. Um, so you mentioned that the first crewed moon landing may not have occurred in 1969 if JFK remained as president. If the first crewed moon landing had occurred some years later in a more gradual program, could the moon program have continued to this day, including a permanent lunar base? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, so. Uh, some some argue that because the Apollo project was committed to reaching the moon in such a short period of time, that that the Saturn V rocket was purpose built for that project, and so it had somewhat limited um, adaptation after that because it was meant to do one thing. Um, so you're 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 right in that um, had we had more had NASA had more time, um, there could have been a lot of other efforts to produce a vehicle that was uh, that was more sustainable and could be adapted to other purposes. And so it's it's possible that the space program could have you know, the lunar program could have continued. But I think that one of the things that's also important to remember is that after Apollo 11, there are five other lunar landings. But after we had reached the moon the first time, public opinion um, and the Nixon administration both started to pull back on their enthusiasm for going back to the moon. Um, so, of course, the later missions to the moon were valuable. Um, by 1972, uh, a lot of the focus was put on international cooperation with the Soviets in low Earth orbit, like space stations. Um, and we haven't gone back to the moon since. So it is interesting to think about whether, had it been more gradual, and uh, that maybe that program would have continued in a way that, um, you know, that would be more sustainable. But we're going back now, right, to mm -hmm. establish, you know, um, establish a base on the moon and, and a launching point, you know, for beyond. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm conscious of everyone's time. So I'll, we'll wrap up here. Uh, again, Andy, thank you so much for a little sneak peek. And I certainly can't wait to get to the exhibition and uh, see the, the launch sequence and all the other really interesting artifacts and um, displays that are in there. I will say before we um, leave, I will say for our members who are on this call, you have received, I hope, your invitation to attend our member preview that will be on Wednesday, March 15th at either 2 p.m. or 5 p.m. It is free, however, registration is required. So you can register on our website, virginiahistory.org, or you can feel free to um, call our main number to register. Again, it's free, but registration required. And we'll have opportunities to see the exhibition uh, first for our members. Then there will be a light reception as well as some other activities uh, going on that afternoon. So I'm looking, I know we're, we're all looking forward to getting y'all in there to see it as well. And then a few other Apollo related programs we have. Andy mentioned the movie Myth Busting on May 9th for Hidden Figures. We are going to have another movie Myth Busting discussing the movie Apollo 13 on March 14th. And we have a special lecture that will take place in April that I'm really looking forward to as a 
fellow alum of the University of Richmond, we will have Leland Melvin, who is a astronaut who has been to space. Um, he will come and discuss his memoir, Chasing Space, of Virginia Astronaut's Journey here at the VMHC on April 15th. And you can register for that program on our website as well. And uh, be on the lookout soon for invitations to our member only Christian uh, lecture on April 19th that will be discussing One Giant Leap, the impossible mission that flew us to the moon by Charles Fishman. And uh, we have many more events than I'm gonna list here in this uh, call, but again, go to our website, virginiahistory.org and you can check out all our, of our exciting events that are upcoming this spring. And as a special thank you to our members, as always, we would not be able to bring these exciting exhibitions and programs to you without your support. So thank you so much for your continued support um, today and into the future. And if you have any questions uh, about this program or about any of the events, that um, I've listed. You can, of course, get in touch with me. And if you have more memories or if you talk to your friends and they have memories of the moon landing, uh, Haley put Andy's email in the chat of this program. And with that, I think we will send you all off uh, to have a wonderful rest of your day and we'll see you at the next Curator Conversation. Take care.